Welcome again to the Salmon Trout Steelheader Podcast. My name is Lucas Holmgren. Today I'm going to be reading a short article from the August-September of 1996 issue of Salmon Trout Steelheader. And this information is of particular interest because now here in 2020, as of this recording, it is pretty commonplace to place carcasses uh, along the headwaters or creeks of rivers um, in areas that fry and smolt or rearing, and not only fry, but also the insects, bugs. Um, and so this is, this is something that you will commonly see, and those that are not familiar with the practice might be a little blown away by the fact that there's hundreds of salmon carcasses along a certain part of stream. But this is kind of the basis of um, where that practice comes from, um, or this is more of a commentary on it, on the study itself. And this article is called Salmon Study May Boost Natural Spawning. And this is written by Andre Stepankowski. It's common sense that if you want to have naturally spawning salmon, you'd better have some returning adults to breed them. But a landmark study by Weyerhaeuser Company fish biologist Bob Bilby shows that one generation of salmon does more than simply bequeath its genes to the next. Their spawned out carcasses, eggs, and newly hatched offspring are a prime food source of juvenile salmon and steelhead. In short, they are the fodder for a cannibalistic method of survival. Nutrients from their bodies also fertilize surrounding trees and shrubs. In fact, Bilby found that 18% of the nitrogen in hemlock, salmonberry, and devil's club in one streamside zone came from salmon, presumably through the wastes of remains of animals that eat salmon. The entire stream and near-water food chain, which starts with a microbial slime, includes insects and rises to include bald eagles, bears, and other mammals, is nourished by their rotting flesh. In farming terms, the salmon bring nutrients back from the sea to fertilize the ecosystem of their natal streams, says Bilby, whose work in the Snoqualmie, Chehalis, and Willapa River basins has been called seminal and incredibly important by colleagues and champions of naturally spawning salmon. Historically, Bilby points out, very few salmon have been allowed to spawn naturally because of intense fishing that has pounded the stocks. One of the implications of our research is that this robs the streams of nutrients and the ability to support and propagate future generations of fish. By taking spawning fish out of streams, fish managers are like farmers who never fertilize and eventually exhaust their soil. This is the kind of thing people have known for a long time, that salmon carcasses make important contributions to productivity. The problem has been quantifying it, which we have been able to do, says Bilby. Traditional emphasis on the nourishing role salmon carcasses play as they break down and feed the lower food chain has missed the direct nourishment carcasses provide for small salmon. Bilby's research has a major bearing on two key issues of salmon management. In large part, as a result of Bilby's work, this fall Washington State salmon hatcheries will start placing a limited number of salmon carcasses along rivers. And well worthy of note is that this article was written in 1996 so it sounds like this started in 1996 and it surely has continued on to this day until recently the department of ecology barred the practice considering the carcasses source of organic pollution and because some people objected to the smell Bilby says his research suggests that traditional escapement goals, estimates on how many returning adults are needed to perpetuate salmon runs, are low. You need extra spawners to provide the salmon eggs and newly hatched fry as food in addition to the eggs needed to propagate the species. We are definitely taking a look at the work Bob has done and what it means for escapement goals for wild fish, said Richard Stone, a fish biologist assisting in the development of the state's new wild salmon policy. Bilby's research started in 1991 as a project to trace whether chemical fertilizers were getting into streams. A technique known as stable isotope analysis proved ineffective, however, because the chemical's nitrogen signature was not distinctive enough to track. But Bilby's team found that the nitrogen in salmon carcasses was very distinct and could easily be traced as it was taken up by animals and plants. He found that 20% to 30% of the body mass of insects studied on the Snoqualmie River was attributable to salmon carcasses. In the Chehalis Basin in 1994 and the Willapa River Basin in 1995, he planted 500, or rather 400, salmon carcasses each year. 
he found that juvenile salmon grew nearly twice as fast as those in streams without planted carcasses. Food was washed out of their stomachs and analyzed. Often it was the flesh of adult salmon, their eggs, or recently hatched fingerlings. Other studies have made a strong connection between the size of juveniles and survival when they go to sea. Therefore, enriching streams could boost numbers of returning salmon, Bilby says. Bilby's research is incredibly important, says John Sayre, executive director of Long Live the Kings, a group that advocates the restoration of wild salmon runs. We need to allow large numbers of fish back into the watersheds so you have the carcasses. Not only does the next generation of fish benefit, they benefit the eagles, bears, and all the other kinds of critters. They enrich and feed the system. Steve Schroeder, a research scientist in the Fish Management Unit of the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, says Bilby's work is an important part of rebuilding wild salmon runs. Placing carcasses out there is not everything. There are too many other things that play a role. We have to work at maintaining high freshwater rearing habitat for those fish. But, Schroeder says, Bilby clearly shows that the introduction of carcasses into these watersheds is an important nutrient source for juvenile salmon. So this is definitely an interesting article going back to 96 and now in 2020 this uh, sort of supplementation of salmon carcasses has certainly been going on for a long time. Of course it's not the silver bullet as uh, the runs are not particularly phenomenal by any means but uh, it's certainly an element and one of the many things that can help the streams, rivers, and the nearby wildlife. So appreciate you listening to the salmon trout steel letter podcast stay tuned please subscribe tell your friends and if you feel like it go ahead and leave a comment check us out at salmon trout steel